42, Module 5, The Scientific Method and Description. The Scientific Method. At the foundation of all science is a scientific attitude that combines curiosity, skepticism, and humility. See Module 1. Psychologists arm their scientific attitude with the scientific method, a self-correcting process for evaluating, evaluating ideas with observation and analysis. Psychological science welcomes hunches and plausible sounding theories, and it puts them to the test. If a theory works, if the data support its predictions, so much the better for that theory. If its predictions fail, the theory gets revised or rejected. Constructing theories. Chatting with friends and family, we also use theory to mean mere hunch. Someone might, for example, discount evolution as only a theory, as if it were mere speculation. In science, a theory explains behaviors or events by offering ideas that organize observations. By using deeper principles to organize isolated facts, a theory summarizes and simplifies. As we connect the observed dots, a coherent picture emerges. A theory of how sleep affects memory, for example, helps us organize countless sleep-related observations into a short list of principles. Imagine that we observe over and over that people with good sleep habits tend to answer questions correctly in class and do well at test time. We might therefore theorize that sleep improves memory. So far, so good. Our principle neatly summarizes a list of observations about the effects of a good night's sleep. Yet no matter how reasonable a theory may sound, it does seem reasonable to suggest that sleep boosts memory. We must put it to the test. A good theory produces testable predictions, called hypotheses. Such predictions specify what results would support the theory and what results would disconfirm it. To test our theory about sleep effects on memory, our hypothesis might be that when sleep deprived, people will remember less from the day before. To test that hypothesis, we might assess how well people remember course materials they studied either before a good night's sleep or before a shortened night's sleep. The results will either support our theory or lead us to revise or reject it. Our theories can bias our observations. Having theorized that better memory springs from, from more sleep, we may see what we expect. We may perceive sleepy people's comments as less accurate. The urge to see what we expect is ever present, both inside and outside the laboratory, as when people's views of climate change influence their interpretation of local weather events. As a check on their biases, psychologists report their research with precise, measurable operational definitions of procedures and concepts. Sleep deprived, for example, may be defined as X hours less than the person's natural sleep. Using these carefully worded statements, other can replicate, repeat, the original observations with different participants, materials, and circumstances. If they get similar results, confidence in the findings' reliability grows. The first study of hindsight bias, for example, aroused psychologists' curiosity. Now, after many successful replica replications with differing people and questions, we feel sure of the phenomenon's power. Replication is confirmation, and lack of replication may enable us to revise our understanding. In the end, our theory will be useful if it, one, organizes observations, and two, implies predictions that anyone can use to check the theory or to derive, or to derive practical applications. Does people sleep predict their retention? Eventually, our research may, three, simulate further research that leads to a revised theory that better organizes and predicts, or our research may be replicated and supported by similar findings. This has been the case for sleep and memory studies, as you will see in module 17. As we will see next, we can test our hypotheses and refine our theories in several ways. Descriptive methods describe behaviors often by using case studies, surveys, or naturalistic observations. Correlation methods associate different factors or variables. You'll see the word variable often in descriptions of research. It refers to anything that contributes to a result. Experimental methods manipulate variables to discover their effects. To think critically about popular psychology claims, we need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of these methods and the conclusions they allow. Page 44. Description. The starting point of any science is description. In everyday life, we all observe and describe people, often drawing conclusions about why they think, feel, and act as they do. 
Professional psychologists do much the same, though more objectively and systematically though. Case studies, in-depth analysis of individuals or groups, naturalistic observations, recording the natural behavior of many individuals, surveys and interviews, asking people questions, the case study. Among the oldest research methods, the case study examines one individual or group in depth in the hope of revealing things true of us all. Some examples, brain damage. Much of our early knowledge about the brain came from the case studies of individuals who suffered particular impairments after damage to a certain brain region. Children's minds. Jean Piaget taught us about children's thinking after carefully observing and questioning only a few children. Animal intelligence. Studies of various animals, including only a few chimpanzees, revealed their capacity for understanding and language. Intensive case studies are sometimes very revealing, and they often suggest directions for further study. But atypical individual cases may mislead us. Both in our everyday lives and in science, unrepresentative information can lead to mistaken judgments and false conclusions. Indeed, anytime a researcher mentions a finding, smokers die younger, 95% of men over 85 are non-smokers, someone is sure to offer a contradictory anecdote. Well, I have an uncle who smoked two packs a day and lived to be 89. Dramatic stories and personal experiences, even psychological case examples, command our attention and are easily remembered. Journalists understand that and often begin their articles with compelling stories. Stories move us, but stories can mislead us. Which of the following do you find more memorable? In one study of 1,300 dream reports concerning a kidnapped child, only 5% correctly envisioned the child as dead. 2. I know a man who dreamed his sister was in a car accident, and two days later, she died in a head-on collision. Numbers can be numbing, but the plural of anecdote is not evidence. A single story of someone who supposedly changed from gay to straight is not evidence that sexual orientation is a choice. A psychologist, Gordon Alpore, said, Given a thimble of dramatic facts, we rush to make generalizations as large as a tub. The point to remember, individual cases can suggest fruitful ideas. What's true of us all can be glimpsed in any one of us. To find those general truths, we must employ other research methods. Page 45 naturalistic observation. A second descriptive method records behavior in natural environments. These naturalistic observations range from watching chimpanzee societies in the jungle to videotaping and analyzing parent-child interactions in different cultures to recording racial differences in students' self-seeding patterns in a school lunchroom. Naturalistic observation has mostly been small science science that can be done with pen and paper rather than fancy equipment and a big budget. But new technologies such as smartphone apps, body-worn sensors, and social medias are enabling big data observations. Using such tools, researchers can track people's location, activities, and opinions without interference. The billions of people on Facebook, Twitter, and Google have also created a huge new opportunity for big data naturalistic observation. One research team studied the ups and downs of human moods by counting positive and negative words in 504 million Twitter messages from 84 countries. As figure 5.2 shows, people seem happier on weekends, shortly after waking and in the evenings. Are late Saturday evenings often a happy time for you too? Another study found that proportion of negative emotion, usually anger-related words, in 148 million tweets from 1,347 U.S. countries predicted the county's heart disease rates. Moreover, it did so even better than other predictors such as smoking and obesity rates. Like the case study, naturalistic observation does not explain behavior. It describes it. Nevertheless, descriptions can be revealing. We once thought, for example, that only humans use tools. The naturalistic observation revealed that chimpanzees sometimes insert a stick in a termite mound and withdraw it, eating the stick's loads of termites. Such unobtrusive naturalistic observations paved the way for later studies of animal thinking, language, and emotion, which further expanded our understanding of our fellow animals. Thanks to researchers' observations, we know that chimpanzees baboons use deception. Psychologists repeatedly saw one young baboon pretending to have been attacked by another as a tactic to get its mother to drive the other baboon away from its food. 
Naturalistic observations also illuminate human behavior. Here are three findings you might enjoy. A funny finding. We humans laugh 30 times more often in social situations than in solitary situations. Have you noticed how seldom you laugh when alone? Sounding out students. What? Really? Are college psychology students saying and doing their everyday lives? To find out, Matthias Mel. Matthias Mel and his colleagues equipped 79 such students with electronic recorders. Using this experience sampling method, the researchers then eavesdropped on more than 23,000 half-minute life slices of students' waking hours. Was happiness related to having simple talks or deeply involved conversations? The happiest participants avoided small talk and embraced meaningful conversations. Happy people would rather happy people would also rather talk than tweet. Does that surprise you? Culture and the pace of life. Naturalistic observation also enable Robert Levine and Ara Norenzion to compare the pace of life, waking speed, accuracy of public clocks, and so forth in 31 countries. Their conclusion, life is fastest paced in Japan and Western Europe and slower paced in economically less developed countries. Naturalistic observation offers Naturalistic observation offers interesting snapshots of everyday life, but it does so without controlling for all of the factors that may influence behavior. It's one thing to observe the pace of life in various places, but another to understand what makes some people walk faster than others. Nevertheless, descriptions can be revealing. The starting point of any science is description. Page 47. The Survey. A survey looks at many cases in less depth, asking people to report their behavior or opinions. Questions about everything from cell phone use to political opinions are put to the public. In recent surveys, half of all Americans reported experiencing more happiness and enjoyment than worry and stress on the previous day. One in five people across 22 countries report believing that alien beings have come to Earth and now walk among us as disguised as humans. 78% of all humans, some 5 billion people, say that religion is important in their daily lives. But asking questions is tricky, and the answers often depend on how questions are worded and how respondents are chosen. Wording effects. Even subtle changes in the order of wording of questions can have major effects. People are more approving of aid to the needy than of welfare, of not allowing televised pornography than of censoring it, of gun safety laws than of gun control laws, and of revenue enhancers than of taxes. Because wording is such a delicate matter, critical thinkers will reflect on how the phrasing of a question might affect people's expressed opinions. Random sampling. In everyday thinking, we tend to generalize from samples we observe, especially vivid cases. Given a, a statistical summary of auto owners' evaluations of their car, of their car make, and b, the vivid comments of two frustrated owners, our expression may be influenced as much, as much by the two unhappy owners, as by the many more summarized evaluations. The temptation to succumb to the sampling bias to generalize from a few vivid but unrepresentative cases is nearly irresistible. It's often not possible to survey the whole group. So how do you obtain a representative sample, say, of the students at your high school? How could you choose a sample that would represent the student population, the whole group you want to study and describe? Typically, you would seek a random sample in which every person in the entire group has an equal chance of participating. You might number the names in the general student listing and then use a random number generator to pick your survey participants. Sending each student a questionnaire wouldn't work because the conscientious people who returned it would not be a random sample. Large representative samples are better than small ones, but a smaller representative sample of 100 is better than a larger unrepresentative sample of 500. Political pollster sample votes voters in national election surveys just this way. Using some 1,500 randomly sampled people drawn from all areas of a country, they can provide a remarkably accurate snapshot of the nation's opinions. Without random sampling, also called random selection, large samples, including round representative call-in or website polls, often give misleading results. The point to remember, before accepting survey findings, think critically. Consider the sample. The best basis for generalizing is from a representative sample. You cannot compensate for an unrepresentative sample by simply adding more people.